This should get you going. Well, that one cut right. It must have been harder on that other end. All right, let's see what it did. <clears throat> Well, actually, the uh, SWR went up, but the friction stayed the same. So let's uh, let me let me let's see here. What can we? Uh, let's do a single frequency, and You had did you did it one forty six exact? One forty six dot eight two. Eight two? Okay, let's go back up. Oh, and I cut it long. W four B S. Yeah, well at one forty six eight eight zero, it's got a two point six SWR. That's not good. <laughs> so again, I knew it was long. And uh, and I didn't know how the turns were gonna work out there. The what now? The the joint between the two. Oh yeah, yeah, I see. So there, there, there is some, there is some, there's going to be some interaction between these two. So, uh, and I don't know why you did it horizontal. I didn't. I'm going to mount it the other way. Yeah. There you that's go. The way it, that's the way that's it needs to be. Mount it. Yeah. Okay. Well, if you're going to mount it that way, you're in good shape. Yeah. Because uh, you've got a horizontal versus horizontal versus vertical about about uh, about 30 dB difference in single strength, especially if the if, if the other antenna is opposite. And uh, I uh, I found that out the hard way. I put up a six meter repeater and I split sight. And uh, first day we put it up, man. Link was terrible, and uh, so I realized that the, the antenna I put up at the transmitting location was horizontal. I mean, it was vertical, and I put the uh, at the uh, receive location. I put it was horizontal, and so once I turned the one and transmit, then the signal came right up and just worked perfectly. So anyway, this is. Uh, yeah, this one's a this one's a little expensive. Well, did you look up how much this one cost? Yeah, that, I know that's about three eighty because I yeah. got one of those. Yeah. So they're not that they're not that much. There's not that much difference. No. And there are a lot of other ones out there. Yeah. This is not this is not the only only three. This is the three I had. And like I say, I got I fell I fell in love with <clears throat> where I got exposed with this when we were putting the antenna up out at the Millington uh, site. Uh, We had to. Uh, we got. We got assigned a 15, a 16 megahertz frequency for Armed Forces Day. So I had to build an antenna for that particular frequency. And uh, one of the guys came out and had one of these. And so while we were uh, adjusting it to get it right on the transmit frequency, I said, "Man, that thing, that thing's fantastic." So I got on and looked, and I said, oh, no, no, that's more money than I'm going to spend. <laughs> but I got looking on eBay, and I found one about a hundred, a little over a hundred dollars cheaper. And so I said, well, uh, and the ones I looked, that was the cheapest ones of the one I looked. So I said, I'm going to go ahead and see if the guy still got it and buy it. So I did, and it works perfect. Uh, but, and, it, and like I say, it does, it does a lot of things. Uh, other than than uh, checking antennas, uh, for instance, I always had a problem when I built antennas. I didn't have a lot of space to, to stretch them out, and uh, come on. That's not what I want to do then, no. I want to uh, I don't want to pay the mulch. 
and scanning. All right, this is uh, coiled up like this. It has a two, two SWR on 10 legs. And it also has uh, one point 1.4 SWR on 50 meg. And it also has one to one to one at 431.5. Just coiled up like this. Uh, yeah, let's stretch them out. Now if we stretch this out, it'll probably be resonant on uh, probably about 18 megahertz. Probably, what's that, 12 meters? No, 18. Yeah, 12 meters. I think that's what it is. So, you don't, you can, you, because it, this looks at the, the resonance and all the stuff, the capacitance, the conductive reactance, all that stuff it looks at to get the SWR. So it really works best if you got it stretched out. You're going to get a more exact SWR that way. But if you're building it and you don't have some place to stretch it out and you want to see if it's close, you can do it without, without that. Uh, and a little, a little later, we'll get through with all of this scientific stuff. We may just we may just stretch this one out. See what see the difference. Uh, okay. All right. Tell me how much coax I got here. Guess. Anybody want to guess? Twenty five feet. Thirty. Twenty. I'm gonna say twenty five foot now. You say thirty. You're off. You're off a bit. It's almost forty. Really? Okay. Thirty-eight feet. Now, I can measure it. I, I've already I've already pre-measured those, and this one I haven't. Anybody want to get have a guess on what, how much coax we got there? Is that one piece? Yeah. Sixty feet. Okay. Well, we'll. We'll, uh, we'll, we'll go with that 60 feet gas and see what's back here. Oh, so you're going to measure with that thing? Yeah. yeah. Now, I measured two or three. I got one right here. I measured two or three of these. Nah, 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 nah. <laughs> so I got my tape measure out by guy. And he was right. Now, I don't know whether you can see it or not. Uh, it doesn't look anything about measuring coax on there, so you can push this. And you get a whole other menu. Thirteen different things it'll do. So we're going to scroll down to. Uh, wait a minute, I went the wrong way. No, I didn't. I want to go to cable line. Okay. Now. You got another velocity factor. This is, I don't know what this is. I don't think I, I have no idea what that is. Uh, looks like RGA X. So, we're going to tell it to go ahead, and it's got a velocity factor of, of 0.66. So it shows it to be 35, almost 36 feet. So it measures velocity factor. Mm -hmm. And a velocity that, that, but we really, we really need to. Let's take that up. To, let's take that up to uh, 88, or not 88, 82. Uh, well, no, hang on a minute. Let me. Let me see if I can get it. Belden RGAX has got a velocity factor of 82. If you're going to get one of those, you better get while we're getting as good they made in Ukraine. Yeah, I know it. All right. So now, it with a velocity factor of 82, it shows it's 45 feet. Velocity factor makes a lot of a lot, lot, lot of difference. So you got to know the velocity factor. If you're building antennas or anything, you got to know the velocity factor. I've searched and searched and searched and searched and searched. So 
somewhere on the internet to get to for somebody somebody that give me the velocity factor of number 12 electric wire because I put up a couple of, of uh, uh, full, uh, horizontal loops and done it by the formula and they never never resonate on the frequency I want them to be. I have to go out there and cut, 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 cut. And uh, so, but nobody did that. The electrical business didn't, didn't determine velocity factor. Well, couldn't you find a piece that you knew how long it was and then plug that thing in until it told you the right answer? You can't do it on just a piece of wire. You got to have a balance. This thing works on a balanced wire, like coax has a good shield and a center point of it. So it's got, it uses the reactants and capacitive reactants and, and inductive reactants and all that stuff to figure out what what you got here. So that one's 40, 41.6 feet. Now we got another length here. Let's see what it is. It is a work on, you know, two thirteen two. You just you have to know what you gotta know what the velocity factor is. Now I think this is our G8X2 looks like. So we'll just it's forty nine feet. Same velocity factor. Same velocity, yeah, point eight. Uh, so that's to me these three things: the SWR, and I like to play around with phasing vertical antennas. So being able to to uh, measure measure coax to uh, to a phasing, you know, right frequency for the phasing, and uh, then finding. I mean, I've got, I've got four, I've got four extension cord rolls of coax, rolled up pieces of coax from field day, and you know, a piece of coax goes bad. Well, that's another thing. Uh, this will do. That's, that's important. Uh, if you ever. Think you've got a bad piece of coal. So you think you got a ground or a short or an open. Okay. This um, oh, will it give you the distance to the short then? It certainly will. TDR, time domain reflectometer. Okay. So we will start this. And it's collecting in data now. And I've got an open. So it's going to show me to an open. As a matter of fact, I thought I brought a jumper. I thought I brought a jumper with me, but I guess I didn't. He used this jumper up here? Hmm? No, I'm talking about a wants to short something like a short the end of it. Oh. Okay. So we say this is 15 feet. So this thing shows it open. At 15.52 feet. Shows open. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, well, we can do it. I mean, um, can you got short it now. Right. Let's it through it. Now, this one you saw, when, if you saw on the graph, it went up like this. That's, a short, that's an open. This one's going to show. Ah, crap. What did I do here? Scan again. Thank you. There we go. Uh, and this one should show it short, and it's going to, the dip is going to be to, to the bottom. We use this thing, we use TDR at the phone company all the time to find opens in cables. I'm using the light and maybe. See? It's 15.52 feet to the shore. <laughs> That's cool. You see the dips going down. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, little smaller screen. Now this, I have been in, Okay, you can let it go now. Uh, this has a. Uh, uh, you look up here at the top.
Well, he ain't got it turned on. But right up the top, it has that symbol for Bluetooth. And it actually has a Bluetooth so that you can go to your... I haven't been able to get it to work on my phone. Of course, I got an old phone. My phone's 15 years old. Well, maybe not that long. But right in there. I'm, I don't, all, I, all I got for is to make phone calls and keep look at my email. The rest of it, I could care less. So, uh, well, you bring up a, a good point. I, I, in my early days, I like got three years into this, I wanted to do a project, so I wanted to make a 10 meter dipole. Mm -hmm. And I ordered the, the stuff, the, whatever the hell it's called, at center point, and got some coax or some wire, and I built one. Then I found this formula on Facebook or on uh, YouTube on how to tune a 10 meter dipole. And I wanted to tune my dipole to center frequency of the, of the lower sideband voice. And man, it, it worked right down to the nitty gritty. Yeah. But my question to you is, is this same formula applicable to all other bands and frequencies? Yeah. What's the formula? Tell me what the formula is. Well, 462 divided by the frequency in megahertz. Yeah. But this one is the current frequency times the target frequency times the length gives you how much you got to cut off. Yeah. Well. And that when you were doing Okay, that, I see what he, he, he tried, they, he's doing the tuning. Yes. He's been trying to tell you how much to cut off yes. just like we cut off yes. over here. And that's what sparked my curiosity. Yeah. Well, would that work for that? Yeah. You know? oh, okay. Yeah. All in, all the antennas are dipoles, okay? I don't care what, what what kind of antenna you bring me, even all the way up to the microwave, it's still a dipole. They've got a, one side of that antenna is where it's, it's the positive side and you've got a negative side where there'd be a, a element like that or where there'd be the ground of the uh, horn on a, on a microwave dish. You open that horn up right down to where the transmit signal comes in, there's a dipole. They're all, di all the antennas are dipoles. So any formula that is set in there for a, a dipole antenna or whatever will work on any frequency that you've got. Now, there's two formulas you get confused. You've got one that's 496 or 492 uh, divided by the frequency in megahertz. Okay, that is for a horizontal dipole. Okay, if you bring it down to an inverted V like most hands use nowadays, then the capacitance between the two elements and the, uh, the, uh, uh, as close to the ground as it is, is going to change it. So that's where that 468 formula comes from. That's for a inverted V. So uh, for a horizontal loop, it's a thousand, uh, thousand and five divided by the frequency in that And the, the, you say it's more like this because they maybe they threw over a tree branch and you got the two sides coming yeah. down. Yeah. Yeah, because I mean, how many people have got two, and how, you know, if you put up an eight, if you put up an all band dipole, each side of each side of it's going to be uh, about 60 feet. So how many people have got 120 feet? They can stretch it out. So yeah. you find something come down this way. Uh, okay, so you got 100 feet, uh, 120 mm -hmm. feet. That's, yeah. that's a long place. So you know, I, I had a I had a 160 meter uh, inverted V up at one time, and I had to put a coil on one end of it because uh, I lost. <laughs> I couldn't go. To, to, to stretch it all the way out, I had to have it mapped out in the middle of the street, and I didn't. So I had to put a put a coil in the end of it to give it the the uh, uh, inductance and everything to to resonate, and it worked. It worked. I just gave up on 160 meters. It was too noisy in the summertime and clickish in the wintertime. Is that coil? Is that something that was made for that purpose, or did you just make the coil? No, you, you used to be able to buy. You used to be able to buy it. Uh, B and W coil stock, all different. It took different sizes, different turns per inch, and you, so we've got you can get into whatever inductance you needed. If you, you know, and if you had the machinery to measure it, right. and uh, 
so, but nobody builds anything anymore. So you can't find that stuff. You, man, if you could, uh, I used to. Uh, if I find somebody on the, I find somebody on eBay or somebody like that selling a bunch of coil stock like I used to buy it all. Because you never know, you know, you, some of it was just as big as my thumb and it had maybe six or seven turns in it per inch, and then I had some the same size that had 20 turns per inch. And uh, uh, I built a, I built a, a an amplifier of my own design one year, and that's what I used was a piece of the BMW coil stock. It was about three inches in diameter, and I, I made, found out from then how much that coil was each turn, how much, so I figured out what I needed, and then I tapped it off to the different frequencies and, and, and made the tank surface out of that being that coil stock. And uh, if you look at any of the big tube amplifiers, that's exactly what you got in there. You got a coil, and it's tapped off to the different frequencies, and uh, you resonate with the with the um, tune capacitor and the load capacitor. Well, you actually do it the tune capacitor. The low capacitor actually takes what the tank coil is as opposed to whatever antenna you got on it. That's that's what that's what's the difference between tube radios and transistor radios. Tube radios had an output of somewhere between say 40 ohms and 110 ohms, so they could match an antenna that's not exactly resonant. Transistorized radios are looking for 50 ohm output, and that's it. If you go in. You, if you go up on SWR, it's going to start cutting the power back so you don't burn up the transistors. So that led to the to the industry coming up with tuners. Mm. And then from manual tuners, they went to automatic tuners. And then from automatic tuners, they went to tuners inside the radio. Not really a tuner, it's just an antenna matcher. Uh, you take a good, a good tuner that's designed right, like the Collins uh, Collins 180 tuner that used to be mounted in most all the military aircraft, and uh, you could stick a clothes hanger in the back end and tune it. Uh, but uh, you don't find you don't find that anymore um, unless I've got one at home that my dad built. That's on the same um, uh, schematic of the Collins tuner. It's got a rotary inductor in it and an air air gap capacitor and a vacuum variable capacitor. And it can handle a lot of the voltage. One side of that circuit's going to have a lot of high voltage, so the, the vacuum variable is what you've got to have to handle that high voltage. Can't sell it. Nobody wants it. Uh, all right, let's go. Uh, let's uh, let me go ahead and finish finish this out, and uh, you can see. You can at least see the the controls on this thing. And this this particular guy doesn't talk about it at all. I don't know why this didn't work. I think see I have. <laughs> so I see he's going through the multi. He puts the best up here on seven. There's two meters. That, I, yeah, that's probably the hand side. And you can see he gets a gets a graphical uh, uh, of the uh, SWR. And what you can do is right here you can you can spread out how far, how how wide that's looking at the SWR. He's got obviously got an antenna that's pretty well resonant in the same spot because that's the uh, the dip is right in the middle of the whole everything. A lot of times when you're using that, the dip will be off to the side and tell you you gotta you gotta move the frequency either, either up or down to get it right at, at the center point. There's a PD off. Return loss. Stud that's that's for uh Making uh, phasing phasing lines. Uh, 
And he comes with this neat little thing you put over in the day. But anyway, and you can see that came probably from yeah. from uh, the Ukraine. All right, let's uh, talking about the, the pro. And it'll do a lot of the same things that the rig expert does. It's just a little bit a little bit more complex on how you have to do it to get to the same answer. And I apologize, I did not bring my external speaker tonight. And the only difference between the regular one and the pro is these sizes. It's the only difference. See, on this thing, get up to 440, you've got to push this button in and push it, put this button somewhere, and everything. And then you got to, then you got to turn the, the knob to the frequency. And it's just a pain, man. When you this one, you can... Set the frequency and push the button, and it does all the other things. And that's another thing. Bunch of batteries. The batteries go dead. You got to take this thing apart to change it, or you got to plug in a power supply. Uh, the rig experts are just plugging into a USB port and it charts. Obviously, you can read the SWR. And it does have accessories. They have this bag that you can put it in. Looks like this is. But you've got to take it out of the bag to use it. The directions are pretty uh, well laid out. They're easy to follow. We'll go that way. No, they're easy to follow. <laughs> If you don't know anything about it, it's true. And yeah, it, 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 it's, I mean, uh, it's like a little bit. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm, MFJ was great, but they, they stopped too soon in a lot of their designs. Uh, I bought a, uh, I bought an automatic key from MFJ, guys. 1969, 70, something like that. And, uh, final thing, uh, I plugged the wall ward in, turned it on, and played with it. And instead of turning it off, I pulled the wall ward out, but when it did, it blew it, blew it up. So I got to looking at it, and I said, well, shoot, now all you had to do is put a Zener diode in the power. To drain that, to drain, to drain that thing, and so I made a copy of his schematic and showed him where to put it in, sent it to him. Never heard from him. You know, you'd have thought if somebody found a, a problem with one of their products and found that the way to fix it, they'd have fixed it. So they were either. Didn't give a damn, or they were hauled that you would question them. Well, when they first started. Martin Jew, uh, Martin F. Jew, that's where MFJ came from. Uh, he uh, he was an a, 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 a instructor at Mississippi State. And he had students building these things and designing them. So that was the early years. Where was he a professor? I think it was Mississippi State, Starkville. I think that's where it was. Yeah. yeah. He's getting flayed labor from his. <laughs> yeah, and well, in the beginning, in the beginning, well, I'm sure they were doing it for grade. Right. You know, well, they were also learning more than yeah. you can learn in a normal yes. class. Um. So you know, it's uh, you know, like this, you got to hit both those buttons at the right time to change and get the other menu. Mm -hmm. So it, that's why, like I say, I bought this and paid 
I was bought this brand new. And uh, I, didn't, I probably only had it a year or two, and then I, I found the, the, the So, and this one's a piece of crap here. Uh, I mean, it's, it's nice. <laughs> It, yeah, it takes a nine volt battery, but you can't read the screen. And uh, so you press a button. Well, that's got nice big letters, you know, to show you the SWR and everything. But uh, it just, it just was not, it was just not easy to use. Yeah, you want to, one of these where you want to check, like when you want to measure cable length, you got to do this and it's got to go up. You got to keep turning until it starts coming back down. And then zero. Press gate, because you see how it says first? That's a second. So, we're going to so you know, if, if you're in the market, if you're in the market for a, a, a good analyzer and you've got something that you're going to know that you're going to use, then I would investigate, like, you don't have to get the Pro like I got. They've got one as much. I don't know what the difference in price is between the Pro and the 500, but I'm sure because it doesn't go as high in frequency, it's probably some difference. Hmm? It was 345. Yeah. So, and that was looking at probably, uh, uh, that from a fungal company. You can probably buy them cheaper other places. I, think I was that's looking at two. I didn't see offhand who it was, but the difference was fifty dollars. Yeah. yeah. And uh, but this one is just this one is just so much easier to use. I just you know I, I was so glad when I got when I learned how to use what I wanted to use. I mean, it's got a lot of stuff on there that 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 I'll never use. Uh, uh, well, let, let me ask a question. Uh, kind of validate my steps for procedures. I've got the same analyzer, and I just bought the uh, Versa 3 and Tenor 2, and I've got a uh, ALC 600 amp on it. And uh, I want it, I bought. Wait a minute, let me turn off this noise. I bought a MFED 10 to 80 meter antenna. It's a thousand watts, so I could use all my power. And I put my analyzer into the input of the tuner and changed the frequency ranges, blah, 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 and adjusted my SWR, you know, with your transmitter and your inductance and all that. And I got to where uh, I have a 1.2, 1.1 SWR on all of the bands going through it, doing that step or that procedure. Is that sound? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did that. I went and I put up my I put up my two horizontal loops. I, I mounted a uh, manual tuner out in a waterproof box on the side of my shack, and because uh, uh, I, I figured with those all that wire in the air, it was good lightning attractor. Yeah. So I put it out there and put my lightning arresters right there and then run right down to the ground. Mm -hmm. And that's how I tuned it for the for the band that I was, you know, using it on. Really? But I, I I don't use that anymore. I've got automatic I've got automatic antenna tuners now and mm -hmm. I just push a button and it does the same thing. You know. And uh, uh, because if you don't have something like this that you can interject a signal into it like that, then you've got to, huh, you got to set this capacitor and you've got to set this inductance and then you've got to fill to see if you can get a good SWR. And, you know, so you've got to keep doing that till you get down to where you want to be. And uh, so it's a whole lot, it's a whole lot uh, easier to take an automatic antenna to and press the button. Mm -hmm. And let it go through its gyrations. And uh, now I've got to, I've got to admit I got to give MFJ a kudo when they came out with their remote antenna tuner. 
Uh, I was sold an LDG. And uh, LDG was a little, uh, a little bit complex. It had a little box that you had to push to get it to tune and everything. And uh, it was a little bit cumbersome, like on field day or something. <coughs> Because you can you can improve the 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 uh, performance and everything of an antenna if you put the tuner right at the base of the antenna. Because hmm. if you don't, you're tuning the coax going out to that antenna too. That's part of the antenna. Yeah. You put the antenna tuner right there at the base of a vertical and hook it right straight into it, and then you're tuning nothing but that antenna. So you get a lot you get a lot more better performance and everything else. Mm. But if you're sitting in your shed and you've got a length of coax going to your antenna, that coax is what's part of what's coming to your radio. Mm -hmm. so don't you want to take that into account anyway? Mm. Well, you, you're going to have to if you don't, yeah. if you don't mount an external tuner. Uh, but, you know, like for instance, I've got a, I've got a beam up at 70 feet. Uh, and it's got coax going to it. But that antenna is tuned right there before I ever put the coax on. Uh -huh. And so <clears throat> there is there is a um, some of the guys that are engineers say that you ought to you you can uh, you can get a half wave piece of coax on the frequency that you're going to use. And you can get a half wave with this. It has a quarter and a half wave. What goes in that coax comes out of the coax. In other words, the same, if you put in 50 ohms, it comes out 50 ohms. Okay. With a quarter wave, it's going to, 50 ohms, and it may come out 10 ohms because the quarter wave, if you look at, if you look at how the voltage and everything is, is uh, distributed on a, on a halfway section coax. The voltage, the voltage goes like this, and the current goes in like this. So the, the current's high out on the ends. Uh, so it, it has, a, it, it can, it can mess up uh, the tune of that antenna if you use a quarter wave. So I have always, you know, if I have a seventy foot, seventy foot piece of coax. Then I'm going to put, I mean, a 70 foot tower, and I'm going to put an antenna on top of it. I'm going to use some uh, half wavelength measurement of coax. So if I, if my, if my, I've got a tri bander up there, so 20 meters is the lowest frequency. So I have got at least 60 feet of coax up there, which is a full wavelength or two half wavelengths of coax to negate having a quarter, quarter wave stub in there. So that's something you gotta think about when you put the antenna up. You know, you don't wanna you don't wanna feed it with a quarter wave piece of of coax because you that can mess your tuning up. So I tell tell you why I'm here ultimately. I'm I'm an E nine in the guard. And my S six guys are always blowing smoke up my tail about why it's always the excuse why the comms don't work. Well, see, now old Sarge is going to get his own ham license. <laughs> and old Sarge is going to sit in class and learn about antennas, too. What, what guard unit are you in? Um, do you know what the state guard is? I've taught the state guard. Yeah, so I'm... I've, I've taught the state guard. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, in the, I'm yeah. the command sergeant major of the local regiment of the state yeah. guard. Yeah. And I get excuses every month about why the radios don't work. I have told them and told them, I'd be happy to come out there and teach them. Well, you're talking to the sergeant major now. <laughs> I did a, uh, about, um, this is kind of off, off the subject, but about, um, I get it might be 10 years ago now. Well, I went out with them on their weekend, on a weekend maneuver. Mm -hmm. And part of their, part of their, uh, mission that we did was to talk to the uh, regiment in Nashville, right, right, and the regiment in um, Knoxville, Chattanooga, 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 the other end of the state. Yeah. And I took them out there, and we 
I put up anti-sodium, put on that show, I put up anti-sodium, yeah. about anti we set our ham radios up and we talked to both radios. Uh -huh. And uh, spent all day out there with them. And uh, I've had them, have, had them come to me twice over the last 10 years and say, oh, we need another anti So I just let me know. You're talking to the guy. Yeah. Well, just let me know. Yeah. Yeah. Just let me know. Uh, I mean, what, what, you know, where and when, and if, if, as long as I'm free, I'll come out there and, you know. Yeah. So, uh, and it, it'd be, be something like this. Uh, but we'll, it, on, on, it's something like you, we'll concentrate on HF. We're going to worry about all this VHF stuff. We'll yeah. bring out uh, a couple of antennas. I've already got them built. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've got, I used to, well, we're going to have a class at some point. Now, next month, let's get that out of the way right now, because I'm going to let y'all go here in a few minutes. Next month, we're going to talk about power supply. Okay? And uh, just as a, we'll talk about, you know, what, yeah, what's what's good and what's not, what you need and what you don't need, uh, and that kind of stuff, and uh, uh, what, what it'll take to power your station. And... Uh, Talk a little bit about grounding, and that's kind of so. That's what we'll that's what we'll do next month. But at some point, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring my go box up there, and I'm gonna show you what a a complete go box should look like. Now you gotta understand that I've I've I've, I've never deployed, never been asked to deploy. But we've done field exercises with the uh, uh, Army uh, Corps of Engineers, with the Navy, and uh, uh, we do, we've taken the Armed Forces Day exercise out to the field and, and done that out in the field for them. So uh, I'm the guy that's got everything. When I go <coughs> and so I've got, and I'm going to bring, when, when I come up, I don't know. That's going to be kind of a hassle to get up here, but I'm going to try to bring the, the full pill box. Have you got it in a case? I got it in a roll around thing about this tall. Oh, that's a serious item. Portable refrigerator? Huh? Yeah, it looks like a little refrigerator. <laughs> with that. Uh, well, I hope they got an elevator in here. Yeah, yeah they do. That's why I have my little cart. When we mm -hmm. were at the other place over there at the, at the church, I had to haul this stuff up, up to the second floor, mm -hmm. and I said, I ain't doing it here. I'm getting too old to do that. So I bought this cart, and it's worked perfect because I do have the elevator. And uh, so we'll do that at some point. Uh, uh, I want to talk, uh, I want to do a, a class on repeaters, and let's talk about repeaters, how they work, uh, what. I hear so many times, I hear guys on the on the air saying, oh, you're a little scratchy, something's wrong with the repeater. And they don't understand how a repeater works. Uh, and stuff like that, so I kind of want to want to talk about that a little bit. Uh, uh, I've got I've got a box just like this size, full. Got three repeaters in it. They're not operational, there's parts. I mean, it's Full parts to build them three repeater. But like I said, it's just talking to a guy last night. Nobody wants to build anymore. They want to go buy an appliance. Mm -hmm. Turn it on and forget about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we'll talk about how a repeater works. Transmit and receive on the same antenna. Transmit and receive at the same time. What does it take to do that? It's called a duplexer. So we'll talk about duplexers, and uh, so that you have some idea of how the repeater works. So if you've done something funny, you'll have a better idea of what what might be the trouble. And because uh, I've I've known guys that have, back when they had the ham store and the repeaters were new, uh, you don't know how many Saturdays I sat down there and worked on glass radios because they came in and said, oh, I can't get to the repeater; it's awful noisy. And I put it on them, put it on the the test. Nothing wrong with it. And it's probably because they were too far out or there was something wrong with whatever, whoever's repeater they were trying to talk to. Uh, 
and so forth. So we're going to talk about that one time. Uh, I think maybe we might even do a uh, might even do a class talk about generators and portable power. Uh, that's not a big issue ain't much anymore because nobody wants us to go out on an emergency with anybody. The city don't want us. Fire department don't want us. Health department don't want us. Uh, that's what we do. Yeah. But uh, we're going to go drill that this weekend. Yeah. But I can't do it this weekend. I've already yeah. got a commitment this yeah. weekend. Yeah. But uh, so the only the only groups that, are, that go out anymore is uh, Salvation Army. They've got Saturn, which is their ham radio group. And they'll they they'll they'll but they're not going out to mitigate the emergency. They're going out there to support the people that come. Same thing with the Baptist have have their own group too, and that's what they do. Uh, I've worked with I've worked with uh, first off I worked with civil defense back when all this was civil defense. EMA, Shelby County Office of Emergency uh, Preparedness. I'm a reservist with them, and uh, we don't even meet anymore. Used to meet once a month. We don't even meet anymore. The uh, the guy in charge sends us out sends out a newsletter. We don't even meet anymore. So, uh, so emergency emergency operations is, is just about dead. But we still need to know about it. We still need to talk about it. Uh, and you still need to you still need to uh, if you're gonna if you're gonna put a generator in or you're gonna get a generator to have to have uh, standby power in case of uh, widespread uh, power outage. I've used mine in the last year. I, mean, I guess uh, the ice storm, I was out for six days and it was nice to have the generator. Why do you say emergency operations are almost dead? They don't want us. They don't want us as ham radio operators. Well, I mean, it's been, that has been the Shelby County that I've been I've been working with these guys since the early 70s, and it's the same thing. Yes, we want you come to a meeting, come to a meeting. We're gonna so that when they submit their request for money from FEMA, they're gonna ask the question: Do you have ham radio operators? Yes, they get money for it, but they don't want us. They don't know what to do with it. They don't know what to do with it. You're lying on it. And, and a lot of that's their own fault. A lot of that came about by people that, want, that uh, were wannabe first responders. And they got out there and got in the way of the real first responders. And so they got all of them. They, just, they made a, uh, a person that I'm thinking about that was very active in doing that. It's long gone. She's dead. And uh, but they just they just turned their stomach over all the first responders. They didn't want they didn't want to mess with them. I built uh, I built two ham stations. I built one at uh, Avery Street down there where where uh, EMA was, and I built one out down at the penal farm where Shelby County Office of Preparedness is. Got beautiful equipment just sitting there. Doing absolutely nothing. I wanted to move my repeater, and I put my repeater up to start with back in the early 90s, uh, strictly for uh, areas to use. Well, because certain people didn't have good home stations who couldn't get into the repeater like they wanted, they wouldn't use it. So I wanted to move it, and I wanted to give it to Shelby County. They've got a 600 foot tower out there and they've got an antenna and everything else. And uh, we had it all set up to move my repeater out there and then the lawyers got in on it. It's not up there yet. Matter of fact, I withdrew my offer. And uh, they just, you know, uh, it's ridiculous. So, uh, 
you know, the, the, the motto or Benny, you know, it's, and if, uh, if all else fails, ham radio. Well, that's what they're going to find someday. Mm -hmm. And there are places where, where the hams are, are welcome. And they're, they're written into their exercises and everything else. We can't, we can't, we can't reproduce, we can't reproduce their communication system because they can't use our radios. We have to have an operator with them if they're going to use our radios. So we don't have enough people in town active enough to... I went through one of their courses and it was uh, Disaster Disaster Center, I forget what number, 300, something like that, one of those, one of those courses that you're going to take. And what it is, we did a, a uh, scenario of a disaster with all of the different organizations that they have at, at the command center. It would have taken us 143 hams three times a day to have replaced their communication. Mm -hmm. Because they appointed me as the communications officer. Because I was the only ham that was there. And they figured, oh, I'll we'll get to it. And, uh, I mean, I drew up the plan. But whether it could have been there's no way in the world it could have been executed. So we don't have any business going out there and trying to replace their communications. Our job in an emergency is to observe and report. You know, that's that's what we ought to be working on. We ought to be working on a net control guys on uh, Delta Club since it's got the highest antenna around. Uh, and make sure it had emergency power. I don't know what the situation is out there at the TV station, whether it's got emergency power or not. That, that would be a generator? Yeah. But that's something, you know, back, what, 2010, 2011, when they had all that flooding, that, that place out there was isolated by water. So it's not, you can't work out there. You're going to have to work in some place. Uh, and that's the, they, that's the way it ought to be, observe and report. And uh, then we can, if we see something that needs attention, then we can report it to the net control operator, and he gets on the phone and calls whoever, you know, and reports it. But we've got to train all the ham operators. You know, we had, we had something like that with the weather service. But the problem was we had a bunch of, bunch of lids out there that the net control come on and say, hey, we don't, we don't need, we just need, you know, quarter size hail or high winds or flooding, you know, flash flooding. And you got 10 guys come on there five seconds later and say, oh, it's raining out here. You know, after they've been told they don't need those kind of reports. So there's, there's a lot of training that we as hams in this club and MARA and, and uh, uh, whatever that other one is down in Germantown. Uh, Neshoba, you know that's the kind of training that, that, that on emergency operations that should be should be doing. Uh, but anyway, I'm gonna get off my soapbox. Talk to you guys for that and meet uh, me to pack up. So next week we're gonna do power supplies. I'm gonna bring some power supplies up and we'll talk about it. Thank you, Ham. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right, let's get all this stuff.